If you're benefiting from this work, uh, we invite you to find a way to support it. Whether you take on a project, help with a project, uh, donate money, donate time, whatever. If it's serving you, please support us in making it available. The outflow uh, in terms of energy and uh, what it takes, you know, you'll notice we don't have any advertisers on this show. We pay to do it. We don't get paid to do it. And so if it supports you, pass on some form of support in our direction. And uh, Machine, do we have anybody in the phone queue with a hand up or anything happening in the chat room? I do not have a hand up. However, I did get an email, and I'm attempting to locate it as a – oh, we did have a hand up. So Is that the one you printed hand, for me? No, that's another one, but I did get another oh. email from someone asking okay. another question. So, But we've got two hands up now, so while I look Let's for the for other it. email, we'll turn on a hand. <laughs> Area code 6, <laughs> 618 oh, – my screen just flipped on me. 618, you are on the air. Hi, Michael and Jeannie. This is Cammy. <clears throat> well, welcome, young lady. Um, How are you? Thank you. I am wonderful. I'm just playing in everything I do and doing it all with intention. And it's just everything's falling together. It's amazing. It's beautiful. Sweet. Um, I just, I'd like to comment on this, and I have a question, but I can't remember what the question was, so I'd like to just go with it. Okay. Oh, I know one thing <laughs> I wanted to say. When I talked the other day, when Jeannie called me, when I didn't mean to have my hand up because it was from Tim, right. I immediately went into Cuba because I have a fear of public speaking. And so I immediately went into Cuba and forgot everything I was going to say. Uh-huh. <laughs> And okay. that was very instrumental in what I want to talk about um, with the learning how to play mindfully. I've started repairing relationships, organizing my house, um, including the garage and just getting everything done, cleaning up the energy to where the, a lot of times I just feel like I'm floating. It, the energy is so light and moving so freely. It's incredible. And Sounds like you're getting to taste human life fully. That's awesome. And yeah, and understanding how Ruka dances with Rachman and Cuba. It's like I get those Aramaic terms now. And awesome. That is just making me see how. All the things I learned about the physical, growing up, working on houses, you know, mechanics on cars, being with guys that were really physically minded um, in Cuba, and I was trying to be in love and growing, and it all just came to where it's Ruka. Does that make sense? It makes sense. The the only thing is, I, I think you might be misthinking about the word Cuba. Cuba is the corollary to Rachma. Cuba is the filter over the frontal lobes of the brain that keep intentions keyed to love. Or pardon me, Rachma is. And Cuba is a corresponding filter over perception that keeps perception keyed to love. It's hostility or fear that moves us into some sort of negativity or uh, or fear type of thing. So Cuba is a, the pairing filter with Rachma. When both are set, what they called Rachma and Kuba set together in the mind were perfect love. When they said perfect love casts out fear, the mind can't produce a fear-based reality when Rachma and Kuba are set. It's just not possible, no matter what we're facing. Well, but it so sounds like you're getting the, that... to experience the fruit of your work, which is awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Like in a way that is just, transformative. My life has been so disorganized for those years that I wasn't doing the work. And I mean, addictions are falling away, um, losing weight. Uh, I am, my bowels are moving freely, you know, just the energy is just like, here it is and it passes right on by. 
Well, there are. You know, we we talk a lot about laws of living. Of course, you did many, many years ago, and there are yeah. ways that make the game work. And, you know, that's all the word law means is how does it work. It's not this uh, silly thing of the rule of a superior that wants to control us, but rather just, well, here's how it works. If you uh, if you follow the, uh, the uh, principles by which it works, then you get the result. And if you don't, then... You don't get the results. So it sounds like you're getting to experience the fruit of your labors. That's awesome. So that's our objective you're here. You're saying that when Rachma and Kuba are dancing together, they're in alignment. That's right. how Ruka is able to really get in there and create the work. That's the pathway. That's the gateway in the opening. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's if hostility and fear are there. Get. Yeah, if hostility and fear are the active filters over either perception or intention, then that's when the higher guidance, which Ruka provides, is blocked. And Ruka, for those that are, you know, maybe new to the show, Ruka in Aramaic is a term that speaks of a literal feminine elemental force that in us, that is in us, pardon me, that literally one eradicates our errors, undoes our errors, and the effects of those errors, and teaches us the truth. So there's a a literal elemental force that has access to our minds when we have those filters set. And there's no such concept in the English language for, you know, there's no word that represents any one of those three key pieces of the puzzle. In the English language, it takes a whole paragraph from from the Aramaic to understand them. Through this understanding that I'm gaining, I'm able to see that everything's neutral. There is no hierarchy. Um, All the way down to, I, I saw it in meditation, all the way down to the first original thought. That opened up. So many doors and windows. The rabbit trails are Mm. just all over the place, but I'm able to manage them and work with them and grow. It's it's amazing. But um, nice. Yeah. I just wanted some clarification on what I was, you know, to send me to the next level of understanding. That would be it. That when when they said perfect love casts out fear, they were saying Rachma and Kuba set together literally means the mind cannot generate anything based in fear because those filters block those things out. And you know, only, that's only what one was filter going on was in in my energy that's what was going on is Rockman Kuba were setting which like made a combustion of energy in to let Ruka in. I think. And it is a practice to do that. Yeah, it's cool. I'm doing everything intentionally. I'm canceling my goals at night. I started implementing the laws of living like you brought up. And nice. It's just all falling together like I'm free again. Yay. And, everything's and notice that, yeah, and notice that the world will do everything it can to resonate or activate hostility or fear. Mm-hmm. Because that's how the world controls us. That's how yes, we surrender being, control, by refusing to become responsible for and forgive the hostility or fear that's in us. Yes, it's easy. I mean, it's been so easy, and me and Matt are working together. And that's thinking awesome. about the energy of these two seventy pound dogs we have in the house, and training with them is just going phenomenal. I mean, they had some training, but we're just taking it further, a step further. All right. Cool. Well, tell Matt I said hello and send my love. I'm just delighted that you're both rocking on with it. That's fabulous. You might hi. want Matt to said uh, hi. get out. Okay. Matt's Wait, listening hello, to you. Hello back. Hi. Sweet. <laughs> Sweet. You might want to get out your Laws of Living book and start to go over that material again and maybe take Matt through it. That would help solidify the whole thing on another level. That is um, 
definitely my intention that I need to reorder Enlightenment because I lost it somewhere along the way. So ah. I'm going to... Well, well, there should be a copy of well, it with your Laws of Living. In, in some cases, actually, of laws if you of check... Because I had the extra green one. Okay, if you had the if you have the extra one and you lost it, well, you lost it. Because, but uh, there were a couple of years where we actually printed Laws of Living as part, or pardon me, Enlightenment as part of the Laws of Living text, so it's right in the textbook. But otherwise, if you want to get another copy, you know, uh, if you go to the um, uh, our catalog, it charges shipping. We don't have any control over that. And it, the book is $25, and then it adds shipping. But if you want to just go to our website and go down to the bottom, there's a donate button. And if you donate $26 right. uh, and mark your, your name and your address and that it's for enlightenment, we'll pay the shipping. So, you know, for people to, make, to facilitate people who want the book to work with while we're doing the study of it, that's what we're doing is we're picking up the shipping. So. Right. Very cool, and we're going to go back and listen to the shows from the beginning, so I want two Enlightenment books. I'll just donate. I'll just do it twice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you just go like to – well, just, just do it. Just go ahead and, and do the uh, – it would be $52, and just mark two Enlightenments in your address, and we'll get them off to you. If you do it today, I'm going to be going to the post office later today. We'll get it up to you today. I'll do it right now. Wherever you are in the world. Um, and where are you these days? I'm sitting here talking to Michael with my husband and my dog in my house that has great energy. Where? <laughs> where? Are, you, are you back in St. Louis? Oh, yeah, I'm in Illinois. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Sorry. Cool. Um, yeah, I'm in Illinois right now. We're getting ready to head down to Missouri in a couple of days. Awesome. So. All right. Well, tell your son we said hello, too. It's been a long time since we've seen that young man. I will tell him. That's. I mean, that's what got me going again. And, you know, I'm being a way better mom. It's, it's incredible. The work works. All right. Um, All right, holding the space. Let's do it. Make right, sure, thanks. make sure when you do that, you send it the address that you'll be at if we ship it out today. So it'll be sure to catch up with you. Oh, I'll go ahead and put Missouri since we're heading out there in a day or two. Awesome. All right, well, travel blessings right. then. I'm glad to All hear right, your voice. You. Just delighted. All right, blessings. Glad Take to care. Bye. Your... All right, bye. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Miss Jeannie, you've got another hand. We do. It's area code 760. You're on the air. Who do we have? Oh, hi, Michael and Jeannie. It's Don David in Palm Springs. Well, young man, you've been telling us for two years you're going to call the show. You did it. (laughs) It's a miracle. (laughs) I went to your website, wygen.org, and I guess you updated it. And... I couldn't figure it out. It looks like I had to put an app on my phone and do all this stuff, and I'm just not I'm technology uh, challenged. Um, but something happened uh, Friday that I really want your your feedback on. Um, my truck was stolen Friday night, and. Uh, yeah, it was it was not just a regular old truck. It was I had had it 15 years and I was restoring it. And I only had liability insurance, and the sheriff showed me two guys. The the cameras caught him at a stoplight and showed me two guys just driving off in my truck, and I've not seen that since. How would no. I go about forgiving? Those guys. I mean, I, I would suggest that you never, ever, ever forgive them for that. Really? Never. Yes, sir. And then I Overall, have another question about forgiveness. I, well, uh, wait, wait, wait a minute. Not idea. finished yet. Oh. Whoa, ho, ho, oh, okay. ho. Slow down, slow down. Not finished yet. Okay. So, when I say never forgive them, Never forgive yourself. Never forgive anyone for anything. I'm not saying don't forgive. I'm saying don't forgive them. 
Now, okay. we've been taught in this culture, if you go back, remember way back when you were listening to the show regularly, you heard this conversation yeah. often, that the Greek idea that they fed us, the Greek misinterpretation of forgiveness is this. I have pain or trauma inside of me that's all your fault, but it's okay. I'll let you off the hook for what's happening inside of me. You know, the fact that I'm missing my truck and, truck and I'm upset about my truck being stolen. So I'll forgive you for that. So if I let somebody else off the hook because I have upset in me over my truck being stolen, have I done anything to clean up or change the upset inside of me? Nothing. So what the Greeks taught us was to pardon someone and call pardoning them, I let you off the calling that forgiveness. And that's what I'm saying. Never forgive anyone if you choose to pardon them. Okay, you guys, you stole that from me. All right, well, I'm going to let it go, so I let you off the hook. And now I'm going to recognize that there is upset in me, upset that I've faced many, many, many times. You know, read my book again, Why Is This Happening to Me Again? The upset that you're experiencing belongs to you. got nothing to do with them. They've triggered it by stealing your truck, but in fact, if, let's say, you know, the bottom line of someone stealing something from you is being ripped off or losing something. So if I hold in me an unforgiven reality about losing, I hold an energy about losing. Remember that everything, energy by definition is motion, and everything that's in motion creates an energy wave. It's a gentleman named Marcel Vogel. I used to uh, keynote at a conference in Colorado called uh, Global Sciences. And one year, Marcel Vogel, who was a 23-year senior scientist from IBM, showed up at the conference, and he brought a thing called the Delaware Camera special camera that has a tuning mechanism between the uh, film and the aperture. When you push the button, the camera shutter opens, and there is a tuning mechanism that if there is a particular frequency present in front of the camera that matches what the camera is tuned to, then that frequency will show up on the photographic plate. You know, a normal camera, you open the aperture, Light comes in, and it registers on the plate. But this Delaware camera has a tuning mechanism in it, and tuned properly, you take a picture, and rather than the light showing up on the plate, what shows up is whatever the camera is attuned to. So the upshot of that is what Marcel showed us is that he could take a picture of the high-energy waves that leave the mind when we think a thought, when he tuned the camera properly. So if I hold in me loss, and Marcel stood in front of me and took a picture and tuned to the frequency of loss, there would literally be that energy of loss emanating from me. And because yeah. we live in a world of resonance, I'm setting up a message. I like to call it the psychic megaphone or the creative wave. I'm setting up a measurable high-energy wave that says, hey, world, I'm supposed to be ripped off and experience loss. Is there anybody that can come and steal from me? And somebody's going to show up. If I forgive them from stealing from me, I've done nothing to change that energy pattern in me, so I'm going to continue to send it out and find somebody else to do it and somebody else, and why is this happening to me again? So... If you choose to pardon them, the Greek idea, let them off the hook, great, do it or don't, but then take out that worksheet and forgive in you everything that has to do with loss. Once you forgive, and the word forgive properly translated from the Arabic means, the Aramaic means remove, once you remove that frequency, guess what? You're no longer setting out a high energy wave that says, hey, somebody come rip me off, because you've forgiven that. So never forgive anybody for anything, but if you find yourself stuck in a pattern of some kind, forgive from within yourself that pattern and let them off the hook or not for what they do. Does that make sense? Is that yeah, right brain it's cell? sort of like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. 
when you hold some kind of hostility toward them. Yes, that's true. Because I have but on a deeper level, faster. but a, on a deeper level, address your loss through forgiveness, and you'll stop creating losses. Okay. Well, this question uh, is along the same lines. Uh, long story short, um, I had a, a Iraq veteran friend that was homeless a lot, and I would let him stay with me, and he was just the best guest you'd ever want to meet uh, or have in your house. I mean, he cooked and cleaned and was very grateful. And uh, well. I, last year, he uh, gave me a call and said, uh, Don David, I'm, I'm suicidal. My girlfriend's cheating on me. Can I come out today for a few days from L.A.? And I said, sure. And then he, uh, one morning, he got up and I guess walked to the store and, and got some alcohol. And by not, you know, I got up about 8.30 uh, and he was already drunk and screaming obscenities yeah. at me. And, and he put me in a death choker hall. They called the sheriff. They wouldn't get rid of get him off the property. I was afraid to scare all the tenants. And uh, they finally came out a second time, and they got him off the property for, for uh, trespassing. But then I noticed right afterward, right after they took him away in handcuffs, I noticed that he had gotten in my jewelry box. He'd been the only person here. I just had moved here a couple months prior. And he stole all my jewelry. I thought, well, Mm -hmm. I can forgive you for whatever happened in Iraq to make you an alcoholic. But stealing from me and very sentimental jewelry. Um, I just saw I'm never going to be able to forgive this guy for that, yeah. even though so, I know. So, so let me start my conversation all over again, Don. Never forgive anybody for anything. Notice we just had a whole conversation about what forgiveness really means, but you're going to continue yeah. the conversation about forgiving him. And I'm going to once again say never forgive him. Pardon him if you choose to. And notice it's the same issue as with your truck you're being stolen from. Notice every time you've experienced a loss or been stolen from, you're the only one that was there. David, that's about you. Yeah. And forgiveness is how you go inside yourself and deal with these issues of loss and being stolen from. That's your work. And you want to clean that out of yourself so you don't have to set yourself up for it again. Pardon me, go ahead. Do you still have the worksheets to download? Oh, of course. Of course. And or just, you know, you can do the worksheet right on your phone. Just go to your app store on your phone and type in Heartland, one word, H-E-A-R-T-L-A-N-D, Aramaic Forgiveness. You can do the worksheet right there on your phone. You can go to the website, whyagain.org. You can do the worksheet live on the website. Or you can download the worksheet, print it off, and do them in paper, you know, right, right there in the like comfort you. of your own home. The beginner sheet, because I have ADHD, it's really hard for me to retain information if I read it. And mm-hmm. so I always did what I called your baby sheets, your baby step sheets, uh, where I could draw you know, because I'm an artist. So I could draw a little bit and and get that out through art therapy. Um, Go for it. And I always thought, oh, gosh, Michael's giving me homework. (laughs) 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 And (laughs) Well, here's my offering. Here's my offering. You sound like, Don David, you're giving yourself homework. You're recognizing, I need to forgive this loss and this thing in me of being stolen from. I mean, notice that was a long time ago when that guy did that, and notice it's just the last weekend that this guy steals your, these guys steal your truck. Same issue. Yeah. Forgive that from you 
that which in you believes you're supposed to lose or somebody's going to steal from you or wh- whatever the specific dynamic is, apply forgiveness yeah. to remove that so you can change that game in your life. Well, I thought it would be different because I don't know the guys that stole my truck, but I do know the guy that put me in a death truck or all stole my jewelry. Yeah, yeah. And and you don't have to, you know, once you set out a signal, anybody that's in resonance with that signal, anybody that's in Dodge is going to come visit when you send out that signal. doesn't matter whether you know them or not. If you set up, hey, I'm a victim, I deserve to lose and be stolen from and experience loss and suffering, somebody's going to show up to play it out with you. Well, when I you forgive that, that I, you free yourself of the pain. I always felt like I had good karma and that shouldn't be happening to me. Yeah, but, but the fact that it's happening to you to say it shouldn't is just denial. Oh, well, I shouldn't be. Ha- well, I agree. It shouldn't be happening to anybody. But remember, Don David, we are creators. You know, it's probably the greatest atrocity that's ever been done to us, and most everybody's bought into that atrocity. We've had hidden from us the fact that we are by nature creators. You create the results that happen in your life. When you recognize that you create the results that happen in your life by the energies that you hold – then you realize that you need to remove those energies if there's a creative process that's happening that you don't like. Removing those creative energies that produce the results you don't like is called forgiveness. The worksheet is about how to uncover and remove those energetic patterns. Yeah. Time to go to work? Yeah, I'll download those today. Awesome. And we'll be holding the space, and as you do it, you know, if, if other questions come up, please call and ask the questions because everybody has the same questions, and it, it gives us a chance to refine, refine, refine the understanding. Well, yeah, I love seeing you on Facebook, so I feel like I have, have not uh, abandoned you guys, but I should be calling in. Awesome. Because normally I can't. Well, so I'm glad to hear your voice. And- I'll, I'll let you go so you can help some other people. And, and, you know, doing the forgiveness process oftentimes is kind of like playing country music backwards. You get your truck back, you get your dog back, you get your girl back, you get your... You're supposed to laugh. It's a joke. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sir. Glad to hear your voice holding the space. Any questions, Thank please call. Thank you, All right, take care. Lots Bye. of love and blessings. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, Miss Jeannie. Okay, I did find both the uh, question that I had printed out for you, if you want to do that one first, and then I found the other question that was emailed in. Okay, well, and I've they got both it kind of printed go along. out. So. It kind of goes along with what you were just talking to Don David about. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Okay, so uh, so this is uh, coming from Sean. We talked to last week, and uh, the uh, he makes a statement or qu- has a question. This question has to do with the tangible process to uh, process to forgiving in quotes the goals. And Sean, we're not suggesting that you forgive goals. It's it's about canceling goals so that forgiveness can take place. The forgiveness is the removal, the end result, the removal of the unconscious, hidden energetic dynamic. So the, the mechanism, the mechanical method by which forgiveness is carried out is that you look in any situation where there's pain and trauma – being injected by the mind into your perceptual construct and you recognize that that construct is driven by your goals. You know, we'll go back to the Harvard research that we've talked about where they showed that in a time frame where 10,000 brain cells are firing, 
The max amount of data that goes into conscious awareness is nine bits. A very tiny little bit of data goes into conscious awareness compared to everything that's moving within us. Obviously, if a small bit of data is selected for use by the mind, something must create that selection. And what we're offering is what creates the selection, the driver for the perceptual constructs of your mind are your goals. So recognizing that a goal is what causes the mind to use this particular data compared to any other. In Aramaic, the word forgive is shabag or shabak, and it translates to cancel. So I cancel that goal, the driver, for that perceptual construct, and that construct collapses. So I cancel the goal so forgiveness can occur. When that construct collapses, it collapses in on its own root. And the root, you know, the things that keep coming back in our lives and biting us over and over and over again are things that are hidden in our own unconscious minds. Go back to ancient teachings and they said, take care of the heart, for out of it are the issues in life. The heart there, that word heart, would be the equivalent today of the unconscious. You must forgive, you must remove from your unconscious that which you put into your brain's image of another. So you cancel a goal in order that forgiveness can occur. So again, I'm going to start the question over again, or the, the statement over, so it has continuity for the next part of the question. So this question has to do with the tangible process of forgiving the goals, as in, how would one simply define the human process, cancel the goal? I realize to local people, their idiomatic understanding would have had no problem with this simple single word meaning, cancel the goal, place in your mind. But how do we explain that to a Westerner, the actual doing it process? Well, a practical example, I, uh, there's a simple example that I use that I think helps to give people the idea of canceling a goal. And so let's just do a little mental experiment. And imagine that about three feet in front of your face, there's a red rubber ball. And in your mind's eye, I'm going to ask you to imagine that you reach out and with your left hand, you take a hold of that ball. So if anybody you know wants to follow through with that, imagine you reach out and you take a hold of the ball, and now you've got it mentally, you've got it in your hand. Okay, let go of the ball. And now once again, imagine the ball is there three feet in front of you, and set the goal to reach for the ball. The only, the only reason you'd reach for the ball is because you set a goal to do it. Every behavior has a goal behind it. So... Once again, imagine you're going to reach for the ball, and when your arm gets about halfway to the ball, cancel the goal to reach for the ball. And what happens? You drop your arm. You don't keep reaching for the ball. That's how simple canceling a goal is. Now, it's not something in this culture that we've been taught to do, and so it seems like a new thing, and gee, how would I do that? But it's as simple as, I'm reaching for the ball, and I cancel my need to reach for the ball. And once I teach my mind to do that, then it becomes easier and easier and easier to do. And then uh, your, your question goes on to say, and can we say a goal was placed there by a false spirit, meaning a filter of hate, anger, blame, or hostility? And filter wasn't used as far as I could tell. What would it have been? What would have been the word then? It may help me see it. I'm a visual guy. So my offering would be that goals have to come through a filter, but they're not placed by a filter. Goals come into the mind in one of two ways would be my offering. One is by an act of will. Will is designed, and I'm talking about the spiritual faculty of will, not willpower as the world talks about, but will is a spiritual faculty with which we 
manage our minds. And the mind, that's what will is designed for. And the mind is managed through indirection. Meaning you can't manage it directly. There's a, a, a mechanism by which the mind is managed. An example of that would be, you know, let's imagine that it's getting cold in my room and I want to turn the heat up. Can I say, you know, of course, today with technology, you could have this technology in your home, but I don't. So could I say to the, could I shout out to the furnace, furnace, turn on, I'm cold. What's going to happen? Nothing. I can't directly do it. I have to do it through indirection. In other words, I need to go over to the thermostat. And when I turn the thermostat up, that causes the furnace to come on. The mind is operated through indirection. It is managed by goals. So a goal is to the mind what the thermostat is to the, to the uh, furnace. It's the control mechanism. So a goal comes into the mind either by an act of will or through resonance. I'd offer that we have millions of goals in our minds, generationally. There are only two ways once you set a goal into a mind for that goal to be removed from the mind. One, it either must be achieved, or two, it must be canceled. You know, if I set the goal to turn the furnace up, I go over and I turn the furnace up, and I come back to do the show. I don't get up and go over and turn the furnace up again and then come back and go back and turn. I do it once. The goal is complete. My mind now is no longer going to guide me to go turn up the furnace. So there are only two ways to get rid of a goal in the mind. One, again, it needs to be achieved. Or two, it needs to be canceled. Recognizing that, then a filter of some form of hostility or fear can be the pathway that this goal takes to come to awareness. But the goal itself is either going to arrive by an act of will or through resonance. And that resonance can be something internal. Gee, I'm cold, I'm shivering. And so that resonates the goal to be warm. And I know that to be warm, I have to turn up the furnace. So that's something that resides within me. So then uh, in the next paragraph, um, what uh, Sean says is, as I understand it, we automatically become love once we return back to the state of just living as a human being. Well, actually, you have never been anything other than love. You're not returning to the state of love. You always have been the state of love. We all are. That's the stuff we're made of. However, if we've given over identification of who we are to something in the mind, then we may lose the awareness of ourselves as love. So you'll remember Yeshua said, in order for you to live, you must die. And he's saying, in essence, if you've forgotten that you are love, if you've stopped functioning as love and you've identified with a construct in your mind that's based in hostility or fear, this is what brings in the power person dynamics out of our codependence work. So if I have a false perceptual construct about myself that I'm something other than love, then it's the giving up of identification of that or the forgiving of that, the removal of that, that frees me from a false idea of self and gives me the opportunity to go back to the truth of who I am. And then you, uh, you, you put the statement in there, it makes you wonder what's behind the whole Adam and Eve story. And I'm not sure just exactly what your reference is there, so I really don't have anything to add to that one. And then you you bring forward the idea of the Christian idea of being saved as a process of returning to normal being without the clouded, unrealistic goals built from false perception. 
Well, yes, that would be my take would be that when we drop identification with the false self, then the self that was lost comes back to awareness and becomes what we function out of. So that self has been saved. That would, yes, I would agree with that. And uh, the unrealistic goals are the, you know, the way that you've written this implies that the um, goals come from false perceptions, but it's actually the reverse. When we load a goal in the mind, that goal will use the best data it has. And if it's false data, then the goal is what will build the false perception. And so if any form of hostility or fear is moving in the mind, then canceling that goal will collapse what's moving in the mind. And when it collapses, the underlying hostility or fear-based content, you'll remember in the step before you cancel the goal in the worksheet, you bring love present to your mind so that when you cancel the goal, perception collapses and love is present, then whatever underlies the false perception is exposed to love. And it's the shining of the active light, the active presence of love on that hidden part of the mind that causes the hostility or fear-based uh, constructs of the mind to dissolve. That's where forgiveness occurs. And then your last uh, statement, when you experience stillness of thoughts, you're back in control. You're no longer hypnotized at that moment. Well, actually, my take would be that when you experience stillness of thought, you'll come back into experiencing who you are as love, which would have nothing to do with control. There might be some benefit for you, just looking at the language of this, there might be some benefit for you in doing some worksheets on control that you equate experiencing stillness as control. And yes, when you say you're no longer hypnotized by the moment, yes, when you collapse the mind's constructs, you're no longer lost or stuck in that particular construct. So that would be my uh, my take on your questions, and I hope that uh, fits. And or if you've got a chance to call in, if there's anything that needs refinement that would uh, would clarify, then you know our call in number is five six three. Nine 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 three five eight one. We could continue the conversation, but that completes my thoughts, Jeannie, uh, for uh, Sean's uh, comments. Do you have another uh, question there, sweetie? Yeah, I had actually responded to him in an email, uh, just giving him kind of um, some thoughts before we addressed it on the show. And one of the things, and maybe I read it wrong, but that when he talked about um, goals being placed by hate, anger, blame, hostility. It's not the goal that's wrong. And and goals are usually wonderful goals. Uh, it, it's not yes. the goal. It's it's the file that's attached to that goal. And so saying exactly. that the goal is set by evil or angry or hate or whatever, it's not. Right. And that that's the driver. If there's content in the mind based in some form of hostility or fear and you load a goal, uh, then that hostility or fear-based content will be processed out of the system by canceling the goal. And we're not suggesting you cancel the goal because there's ever anything wrong with the goal. I mean, you could have goals that are off base, uh, but most people's goals are pretty much in alignment with, you know, where they want to go. And as you say, Jeannie, the problem is not the goal. The problem is when you load, the reason you're canceling that goal is because you recognize that when you load that goal in your mind, your mind goes into some form of hostility or fear, and you want to forgive as to that hostility or fear. Right. And then I did find the other question. Um, okay. And this is cool. getting back towards the Aramaic. Um, so she is her name's... Andre, or Andre, and she says, um, when Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God, 
What's your take on that from the Aramaic? Well, my take on that would be that your obligation, if you're living, you know, if you're playing in Caesar's realm, then what he's saying is you've got to pay attention to what you're doing. You know, if you're in commerce, if you're in commercial business, then you're going to have to play according to the rules of commercial business, Caesar. And, you know, when he says, pay me my tax, pay it to him. And that was the, the, the situation that was going on when that whole circumstance of that whole conversation came up with Yeshua. They said, well, your master pays the tax, doesn't he? And uh, they say, well, 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 yes, of course he pays Caesar the tax. And they go to Yeshua and they say, well, Yeshua, do we pay Caesar the tax? And he says, well, we render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. In other words, if we're in some sort of commerce, if I went out and I, you know, um, went to a, a wholesaler and I bought a, a, a bunch of pictures that I'm going to sell and I'm going to put it in commercial business and I'm going to pay the tax for being in commercial business. And then I render unto God that which, God, that which is God's. If I'm interacting on and my work is related to God's work, then what he's saying in the Aramaic context is, then I'm going to put, give my tithe to God. It's not going to be Caesar's. So render, you know, whichever realm you're playing in, render unto that authority. That would be my take on the Aramaic. It's, it doesn't come across very well at all in the Greek teachings. But that's what he's saying is which, which realm, which kingdom are you playing in? And make sure that you honor that kingdom. You're obligated. Any thoughts on that one, sweetie? No, that's good. And you're down to just 10 minutes, so I don't know if you're going to have time for your reading today, but there's no other means. It doesn't sound like we're going to get to do that, but that's okay. We did have, there was another conversation that I had with Michael Tatey, and uh, he had some questions, and uh, is he by any chance on the line? Michael, are you out there? So we want to raise your hand? No. He had said that he wasn't going to be okay. actually he on the call, but he picked to. up the archive. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, basically, you know, we talked uh, toward the end of last week about this whole idea of uh, a Sabbath and a day of rest. And Michael had shared that uh, he had some friends that were in a a church that um, he was a member of, and they went along with what they considered to be the ancient Sabbath, which the scriptures talk about nobody will change the Sabbath, and that you know the Christian church uh, has its Sabbath on a Sunday, and the Jews had their Sabbath on a Saturday. And this particular group of people uh, had their Sabbath on a Saturday because they thought that was the law and it was a big deal and was something to fight and argue over. And he was talking about, you know, some of the history and how uh, dates were changed and who says what's who's where's what's and wherefores. And um, the, the bottom line of the conversation was that he had friends that were in that Saturday is the Sabbath, and if you don't practice a Sabbath, then you're a sinner. And when he did research, he came up to, I forget who it was, Pope Leo or somebody that took 10 days out of the calendar and changed it. Like, who knows what the original, was it Saturday, was it Sunday? And were men made for the Sabbath? Or was the Sabbath made for man? One of the points that I made was that yeah, Yeshua's bottom line was, hey, you're not here to be a slave to Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The bottom line was the idea of turning your attention inward for a day a week, paying homage to and developing your relationship with love is important. And so make sure you do that. Are you going to get into a big fight and lose your the presence of your love over 
who's right about what the Sabbath is. And he had shared that some people who were at one point in his life very dear to him basically threw him away because he started to question whether it was Saturday or Sunday and, you know, what's the point? If you go the whole point of the teaching of this man called Yeshua is to restore us to the presence of love. To come back to the point where we realize who we are as human beings. Now, you'll notice that a mind can use any reality at once in order to project its pain, trauma, and rejection. So you can bet the person who would not fellowship with you because you moved from Saturday to Sunday has a reality where love has been rejected from them. And they can project that into their brain's image of you if you happen to con- you know, confront that reality. Or they could go, you know, I just realized that we had this discussion about Saturday or Sunday. I've been taught by somebody that because you choose a different day than I, I should reject you. And now I just realized that I broke the first law, which is Rachma, maintain the condition of love in my mind for every human being that I contact. Even if they're doing something that I don't like, what I'm going to do is I'm going to maintain the condition of love. If I hold a reality that someone triggers in me, and that reality comes up, and I put it into my brain's image of them, then I can pretend I'm rejecting them because of, and it's their fault because, look, they don't agree with me that it's Saturday or Sunday. What we would say to that person is, stop, take a breath, notice that you're projecting separation over a conversation about Saturday or Sunday, like that's the end all and be all. And the end all and be all is function as a human being. Function with love toward your brother, toward yourself, toward your neighbor. And if you can't, apply forgiveness and own whatever is in you that's creating the rejection. And as you forgive that which is in you that's creating the rejection, who is there to reject? No one. Well, how about the really terrible criminals? Certainly we should reject them. Really? Why would you do that? Well, because look what they did. So let me see. Somebody out there does something, and you give up the presence of love in you because of what they did. We call that denial. Remember, whenever I think or speak, so something outside of me is the cause of what's moving inside of me, I'm in denial. And when I'm in denial, I dissociate from a part of myself. I have to hide something from myself. And now I start living in a lie. Whatever the lie is that has caused you to give up your awareness of yourself as love, or causes you to believe that someone else doesn't deserve the presence of your love, that's your work. That's what you need to be about forgiving. And when you do, you return to your own body-mind unit as the active presence of love, and there's nothing that anybody could do that would cause you to give that up. Because the first order of business is to maintain your human life which is love. So once again, in Aramaic, love is not something we do to somebody. It's not something we can get from somebody. It's not something we can give to somebody. We are. And if I lose the awareness of myself as the presence of love, 
then whatever the circumstance is in which I do that, I apply forgiveness. When I apply forgiveness, I literally remove the energy pattern in me that blocks my awareness of myself as the active presence of love. And so I get to maintain my human life no matter what. So remembering that love is the essence of what we are. And when we're in pain, it's because we've given up that essence. And the forgiveness, the removal of whatever it is that we're in, we think we're in pain about, literally removes the energy pattern that blocks our awareness of ourselves as love and we're restored to the active presence of love. That's what forgiveness does. It's a restorative process. It removes the blocks to the awareness of ourselves as human beings, as the active presence of love. And that's the whole bottom line and the whole objective of this work. It's to be restored to the truth of who you are. You're made in the image and likeness of the creator as love. That's all. And whatever your culture's taught you to give that up for, stop it, forgive it, be restored to who you are. That's the bottom line of this work. So thank you for joining us. And create the best year yet of your eternal life. It's an awesome gift to give the world. The world needs it. You're qualified to give it. Have a blessed day. Thanks for joining.